Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me tonight. Sorry I couldn't do it last night. Uh, I had to go to a, a fundraiser uh, for the American Cancer Society, um, helping out with that. And so that took precedence over doing a band nerd hangout. And wow, is there a lag on this tonight. Um, it is a good... 22nd lag? Yep, 22nd lag in what I say and what you guys will hear. So uh, forgive me for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, go ahead and say hello if you're here. Um, and we'll kind of just do an informal band nerd hangout. Talk, uh, I guess tonight's topic is trumpets. Um, and I guess I probably should address the, uh, the big elephant in the room. If you have not seen the video I uploaded earlier today, ooh, that got, gets a lot of heat from some people. Um. Um. Oh, I just got a comment. Hello, Jared. Hello, Sans. Hello. I'm not going to try, uh, ETH. A E D H. I I don't ask me to pronounce that. Um, is that even something that's meant to be pronounced, or is it just um... anyway? Uh, so uh, yeah. So the the elephant in the room, of course, is um, I uploaded a video called uh, "Why I Hate Marching Band," um, and. I stand by what I said, but I know there are some people out there who absolutely do not agree with me on that. Um, marching band is probably one of the most divisive uh, topics out there. And, uh, and I say that at the very beginning of the video, the most um, contentious and argumentative topics I've ever had on my Facebook page have been over marching band. It's not politics, it's not religion, it's marching band. And, I mean, it is so polarizing. It's either you love it or you hate it. There is really no in-between among musicians. And I am firmly in the I hate it camp. Thanks, I hate it. But anyway, um, so, yeah, um, trumpets tonight. Um, uh, let's go ahead and I'll field kind of any questions you guys have. Um about uh, anything we've covered up to this point. Um, I guess I probably should also talk about the uh, the Patreon and the new courses that I'm going to be offering soon. And I've still got to work out logistics on all of that. Uh, but um, with, with the Patreon, that's going to be super simple. It's already set up now if you want to help support on that. Uh, it's you can range from a dollar a month to a hundred dollars a month. Uh, I guess theoretically you could do more if you want, but uh, yeah, I would check with me on that first. But uh, that goes from basically just helping to support me producing videos all the way up to $100 a month level is like a 30 minute uh, lesson a week with addition, uh, you get a free book a month. Um, you get... Uh, access to all courses I teach and so I mean that's actually a really really good deal I mean it's like half price for what you're getting okay so Jared what exactly is an alto trumpet okay um so we're all familiar with our regular B flat trumpet um there are so an alto trumpet is pitched either in E flat or F uh, a fourth or fifth below that caveat on that though there is there are two, so let's just talk about f for right now there are two instruments pitched in f uh that uh the fundamental pitch is uh, a fourth below the b flat trumpet one is the alto trumpet the other is what we would call the f trumpet and the so this this is where we get very very um confusing because the trumpet actually fundamentally changed in the late 1800s. So we'll just talk right now about the modern trumpet because that's a little bit easier to understand. So basically you just take a trumpet and I've got my uh, cornet here. So imagine this were a trumpet and you just scale it up 
in all proportions, bore size, and length. And by doing that, you get an alto trumpet. Um, if you see a part in a score that says bass trumpet in E flat, that's an alto trumpet. Uh, Rimsky-Korsakov is really the first person to uh, start using the alto trumpet. He claims to uh, invented it. Um, um, I, I don't know if I would say go as far as to say he actually invented it, but uh, it, was def it was probably around at that time. Uh, he would use it in most of his later works, like Mlada, uh, Le Codor. Uh, he was also followed by uh, Stravinsky would use it in some early pieces. I think the, was it the Scherzo Fantastique or the Fireworks or one of his early pieces he'll use alto trumpet. And he also uses it in uh, the Rite of Spring, but he calls it E-flat bass trumpet. So there's a lot of confusion there on actually what instrument to uh, play. And most people are actually going to use a B flat or C bass trumpet on for that part. Um, Shostakovich uses it. Uh, Prokofiev uses it quite a bit in his early works. Only the early works. Um, the same with Shostakovich. Shostakovich, I think, uses it in Symphony 1 and then never again. Uh, I think I actually have the score to Symphony 1. I may check that out here at some point. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's the alto trumpet. It's just a larger version of the trumpet. Um, we'll get to the other F trumpets here later. Would I say I prefer flugelhorn or trumpet? For what purpose? And the, when, when you're asking those kind of questions, you always have to ask about purpose. And, um, I want a trumpet on a trumpet part and I want a flugelhorn on a flugelhorn part. As a composer, I would much rather write for flugelhorns than I'd rather write for trumpets. Um... Case in point, Symphony 3, um, I do not use trumpets at all for the bulk of the piece until the last five minutes. And it's a 70 minute long piece. So you go 65 minutes with no trumpets, but you do have flugelhorns. So this is uh, interesting. Uh, Symphony 4, by the way, will have trumpets all the way through, uh, except for the second movement. And I'm gonna have the uh, trumpet switch over to flugelhorns for that one movement. Uh, by the way, big news on Symphony 4. I actually completed an entire movement today, start to finish. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever written a, a piece that quickly. It's like a five-minute piece, fully orchestrated, fully composed, start to finish. Um, wrote it, um, for, started this morning, just finished it a little bit ago. I've got to do editing tomorrow, but it should be good to go. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, that's... My, my take there, I use trumpets when it calls for trumpets, use flugelhorns when it calls for flugels, uh, and get creative. And don't assume that flugelhorns are a type of trumpet. That's that's such a, a common mistake that's made. Flugelhorns are soprano tubas. They are not part of the trumpet family. Yes, they're going to be played by trumpeters only because there's a rule in, in brass doubling that... All soprano brass instruments, so most trumpets, cornets, flugelhorns are all going to be played by trumpeters or cornet players. The middle brass, trombones, euphonium, are all played by roughly the same group of people, though there's some, um, there's like a Venn diagram between trombonists and euphoniumists. And then the contrabass or bass members, so tubas uh, and chimbasso are all going to be played by uh, tuba players and contrabass trombone will go kind of in between some of that um hello blackheart um there's too many m's in the first name for me to be able to pronounce that and the computer's too far away um but anyway so yeah um so we'll talk trumpets in the band and it's actually a pretty um interesting story uh trumpets in the band Ah, yeah, finally catching one of these live. I don't normally do them on Friday night. Um, perhaps I won't get too much hate tonight um, with the um, the Why I Hate Marching Band video that went up. And um, because uh, it's Friday night and everybody's at marching band. Um, uh, Sweeter, you haven't missed much. Um, I mean, we just started nine minutes ago, so it, somebody asked about uh, a little bit about alto trumpet and talked about 
flew hard. Other than that, and then I addressed, I know you saw the video because you were commenting on it on the Why I Hate Marching Band. And that's a, a, a fun, fun story there. Um, this is like my fifth cup of espresso today. Blah, blah. I will not sleep tonight. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, story of trumpets in the band. Um, what do I think about the contrabass trumpet? Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and address this. Um, I, I, so it's a, it's a uh, okay. So yeah, okay. We'll get to contrabass trumpet and then uh, trumpets in A here in just a bit because uh, well, actually, I, I can talk about these kind of together because I was able to get photos of both of these instruments. So. Contrabass trumpet was actually the first trumpet I was able to get a photo of for volume three. Uh, I've got the book right here. I happen to be friends with a guy named Carl Kleinstuber. And Carl is a uh, tubist extraordinaire. Um, he, and he is known uh, for having made, years ago, uh, a whole bunch of contrabass trumpets. And I, I knew about Carl back in the uh, 90s, back uh, in the days when the only resource you could find online was Contrabass.com. Um, for those of you old enough to remember, uh, Contrabass.com was run by Grant Green, and it was the first real repository of uh, instrument nerdiness on the internet and uh, it was in the days we, before Facebook you had we had a um, a mailing list so every day you would get uh, mail from instrument nerds around the world and um, Carl's name came up every now and then well I started looking about it when I was doing research for um, book three and I reached out to Carl and it turns out Carl doesn't live very far from me. It's only, he's only like 25, 30 miles from me. So I just said, and, and he's a dealer for Wessex tubas. So he had the entire Wessex um, stock in his living room. So I just went over to his house and photographed stuff. And uh, as we were finishing up, I said, do you still have one of your old contrabass trumpets? I said, yeah, it's out in the garage. Let me go grab it. He brought it in, dusted off a bunch of old cobwebs and, um, here it is. Here is the uh, Carl's very first contrabass trumpet. This is an instrument in F. Uh, and he built it so that he could play uh, jazz on it. It is a very, very light instrument. So I was able to hold it and mess around with it. I didn't play it because I'm not a brass player by any means. Um, but... Um, Surprisingly, what I found is uh, Carl designed it um, with a very, very small bore. And I was under the impression that a chimbasso could essentially fill in the role of a contrabass trumpet. But once I finally got my hands on a true contrabass trumpet, and I would had my hands on a chimbasso once before... Um, uh, it is, it's so, so light. Uh, I mean, the Carl's, uh, contrabass trumpet was so light. It's so narrow bore that I, I had to reverse my thinking that the, the Chimbasso's bore was nearly double the size of the contrabass trumpet. Uh, as with the old, uh, A trumpets or cornets, uh, in fact, let me show you the trumpet group photo I got. This is actually one of my, my disappointing areas with, uh, not disappointing, but I, I, I'm personally a little bit more disappointed because this is the only uh, trumpet group shot I got. Um, I was only able to find someone with four sizes. So I've got D, C, B flat, and this one down here at the bottom is an A trumpet. It's actually a B flat slash A. Um, and you notice it's a little bit longer and what I did when I was doing the photograph, it's adjustable to change between uh, B flat and A. So I pulled out all the slides and changed everything and it's set up in A. Um, uh, 
I'm just now seeing the picture on the screen. That's how much of a lag there is. And you can't see that at all. Maybe if you're in full screen. So, sorry about that. Tell you what, actually, let me um, get that a little bit closer. Ah, wrong way. Uh, there we go. So, here you go. You should be able to see uh, the D, C, B flat, and A. A is at the bottom. Um, but yeah, so I was able to see that. And at one time, Trump, uh, the, the trumpets we know today were, uh, you, you had the pair like you had the clarinets and B flat and A, and that was really pretty commonly seen. Um, the French would use, um, the C trumpet. So we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I, I, I want to go all the way, way back into history, and we'll, let's just we'll go back to the the Baroque era. Well, actually, we need to go back before the Baroque era, because um, trumpets have kind of always been there in the band. Um, in times, it was just trumpets. They, the fanfare instruments they announced the arrival of the king, or um, it. I, I found this out within the last week. Uh, interestingly, uh, it used to be that in court in England to announce the arrival of the judge, um, there was a trumpet fanfare. And the trumpet fanfare was which uh, Handel took it, it, the opening of that and it became the trumpet shall sound from the Messiah. And I happen to know the Messiah right now because I'm, I'm singing it with our uh, local chorale. Uh, I don't think we're doing the trumpet shall sound, though, but it's kind of a nice symbolism there. He took the judge's call and said the trumpet shall sound, the judgment day. So kind of cool there. Uh, but yeah, trumpets kind of always been there. And back to Handel, we see trumpets quite a bit in um, something like Music for the World Fireworks for band. Here's the thing with those old trumpets. Um, so we've got our, our B-flat cornet here. I've got a trumpet over my wall, but I really don't want to go get it down. Um, the trumpets they were using were not quite double this size, but nearly. So this is B-flat. Uh, the main trumpet being used at that time was in D, um, a sixth below this. But the bore size was the same or smaller than on modern trumpets. Therefore, with that smaller bore size and longer tube length, the, the trumpet players were able to play higher and higher harmonics. So today, we'd say a trumpet player would stop at about the eighth harmonic. That's, that's standard textbook range. Of course, we know that trumpet players can and do go well above that. Uh, but the trumpets of old were designed to go up to the 12th harmonic or even the 16th harmonic like horns do. And you see... Um, some virtuoso music in the Baroque era that goes up to that 16th harmonic. Uh, it's not terribly difficult on the old D trumpet. Uh, yes, they played the upper harmonics like the horn. So on the, the bigger D trumpet, um, that wasn't too bad. The high note would be a D above the treble clef. But then Mr. J.S. Bach comes along and writes a piece for the F trumpet. You know, remember, the F trumpet is still bigger than this. It's a fourth lower. And he writes up to the 16th harmonic on that. And this is the Brandenburg Concerto. And the trumpet player just kind of freaks out. It's like, are you kidding me? This is hard. In fact, it is hard to this day that it's going up to a high sounding F above the treble clef like the oboe's highest note, like in the flute's highest register, in the clarinet's highest register. This is a trumpet going up there. Uh, and so that piece becomes a, kind of the show-off piece. If you're a good trumpet player, you can do it. Most trumpet players can't. Even today, you, it's hard to find a trumpet player who can play the Bach Brandenburg Concerto Number 2 well. 
and that's on a valve trumpet. On a natural trumpet, it's even harder. Well, the composer soon realized how difficult that was, and with the death of Bach, that kind of writing just went away. And so you get to Mozart, you get to Haydn, you get to Beethoven, and they're scared to write up above the 12th harmonic. You don't see much being written above the 12th harmonic. And this is how it is throughout pretty much all of the Romantic era until the last two decades. So from 1750 to 1880 or so, you're, you can write up to the 12th harmonic because all the instruments they're using are a lot bigger than this. The smallest instrument they're going to be using is an F, a fourth below this, but with a much smaller bore so that it favors the higher notes. Now, 1750 to 1880, that's what, 130 years, and that um, has a big event happen in the 1820s, 1830s, and that's valves. Uh, so valves get added, but nothing else on the instrument changes. So these trumpets are still like this long. This would be about the size of the old trumpet, still wrapped up, and they put the three valves on them, and they're still going to play up to that 12th harmonic, sometimes a little bit higher. Um, there are a few instances going all the way up to the 16th harmonic. Now, this is, this is an old F trumpet, and what they would do is they would have a little crook in there that they could add in to lower it a little bit to E, to E flat, to D, and a really low one will be C. So if you see anything that says C trumpet in most of the 1800s, it's an instrument nearly double the length of this. And it's a, it's a big instrument. It, it is probably the instrument that uh, Richard Strauss was writing for at the beginning of Also Sprach Zarathustra. Bum, 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 bum. That would have been on four gigantic C trumpets that are the same length as the modern C bass trumpet. Uh, the thing is, the longer the instrument is with that relatively narrow bore, the easier it is to get the higher harmonics because the higher harmonics are lower. So the 16th harmonic on that old long C trumpet was the same as the 12th harmonic on the uh, F trumpet. Well, trumpet players got to where they were looking at cornet players like, man, y'all have it so much easier. I bet if we made a small trumpet, a trumpet, so before it was tromba was the name pretty much used. Uh, tromba means today trumpet. Uh, so not modern conception of bass trumpet, though, because of the bore uh, high and emphasis. Yeah, so, yeah, the, the, the old long trumpets had a bore as big or smaller than the modern trumpets and a very, very shallow mouthpiece. Um, the mouthpiece they would use would almost be like what uh, a modern jazz screamer would use, uh, a lead jazz player. So, I mean, tiny, tiny mouthpieces. Um, and the sound of these big trumpets was huge. I mean, they could overpower the orchestra and they sounded so different. And it is very, very difficult to find recordings of these instruments because players today don't want to touch them because they are so blasted difficult. Uh, players are not used to playing up into those higher harmonics. And the thing is, the higher the harmonic is, the greater the chance that you're going to miss it. Um, horn, it, it, you know, horn's an octave lower than the trumpet in, in this regard. So it's not as tricky, but you take that up an octave and suddenly whoo, those super high notes become much closer together and they're much harder to hit. But the sound that they got was 
heroic, it was noble, and it was overpowering. And it's it's one of those the the timbre of the instrument would change if they were playing soft. It was it could be blend in, be an absolutely beautiful sound. But as you started to go bigger and bigger and bigger, the sound just got this ring to it. Um, horns have a technique called cuivre, which means brassy, and the old trumpets could do that. Basically, it's almost to the point of being blatty, but that was just an inherent characteristic of the old F trumpets. Uh, but trumpet players got to the point where they said, we'd rather hit the notes with accuracy than play with that big noble sound. And so they said, well, we could have a B-flat trumpet, same as the B-flat cornet, and we'll be able to hit all of our notes. Easy peasy. And so they did. So by the late 1800s, really by only about 1890 or so, do we see the B-flat trumpet. Uh, one reason we don't find a lot of solo literature for the B-flat trumpet until a much more modern era. The French would go one step further, and the French would go to a C trumpet. And there, the C trumpet was uh, a French uh, instrument used a lot in England as well. The Germans used the B-flat. And Americans, just depending on which tradition they would follow, are they a French player or a German player? Um... And the, so you've got those two traditions there, the smaller instrument. Um, so these instruments could play the notes much easier, but they lost the tone color. And um, interestingly, uh, a book right at the time when this uh, changeover was taking place, the Cecil Forsyth Orchestration, and he really laments the loss of the old F trumpet, said, you know, Ten years ago, the F trumpet was the only thing you saw, and now we have these puny, you know, little trumpets. They don't have the same sound. They're not heroic anymore. They're small. So this, I know this is a cornet and not a trumpet, uh, this is a small trumpet. Well, guess what? Trumpet players said that's not small enough. So Rimsky-Korsakov comes along and says, I want a small trumpet in E flat. And so, uh, an octave higher than the old E flat trumpet. And so he starts calling for it in the 1890s with Mulata and I think Lakota Orr as well. Uh, Vincent Dandy would do the same. And of course, who is Rimsky Korsakov's primary pupil? Igor Stravinsky. So Stravinsky brings in that small trumpet into the Rite of Spring. So we've got. Uh, in not an E flat trumpet in this case, but a D trumpet. The E flat and the D trumpet are basically the same instrument. You can just interchange slides on a lot of them. Uh, though some people will say that it's better to have uh, one designated instrument in D, one a designated instrument in E flat, because they different instruments will spawn a little bit better in those keys, but nonetheless. And then, by about 1920, people were starting to look back to the old Bach stuff and said, man, none of these instruments can play the uh, the Brandenburg Concerto from the 1730s. And so what they did is they started making smaller and smaller trumpets. Um, and they would make one in high F. So a fifth above this instrument and half the size of the old F trumpet. And... That instrument was designed to play the Bach Brandenburg Concerto. And even then, it was still difficult. So, people, um, uh, the Mahion Company in Belgium designed uh, what they called a Bach trumpet, which was a further fourth up in high B flat. Today, we call the Bach trumpet a piccolo trumpet. It is uh, like 67% the length of what Bach wrote for. I'm sorry, 33% the length of what Bach wrote for. So Bach wrote for an instrument that was six feet long. So my fingertips are about six feet here. And the piccolo trumpet is two and a half feet, roughly there, to play the same notes. And it's still hard. So Bach is hard. Bach is hard, Mozart's hard. Um, Everything else is gravy. Um, 
So trumpet players, basically since right around 1900, a little bit before, said we want smaller instruments, and they just kept getting smaller and smaller. Um, so you will find orchestral trumpet players will try and play everything on a C trumpet uh, because they feel that that's the smallest instrument they can do to still get the range of notes and produce a big enough sound. Uh, there's a tradition in England, the top player in a lot of the English orchestras will play on an E-flat trumpet. And so there's uh, a lot of that. Now this gets into something I talk about very early on in Volume 3. And it's what I call the is versus ought problem. So what that basically means is what ought to be done is not what is is done. So when I say ought to be done, well, you should be using the instrument that the composer called for. So if the composer called for an F trumpet, a big F trumpet, you should play it on a big F trumpet. What is done is they're going to play it on a small C trumpet, thereby changing the sound of what the composer intended. This is, um, this is a pro an issue, I won't say it's a full-on problem, but it is an issue when trying to deal with uh, authentic performance practices, with trying to recreate sounds that composers were intending. Um, and, and so we have to realize that the instruments that the composers wrote for are not the instruments that are going to get performed on today. And this is most often the case in the brass section and trumpet players tend to do this the most. Trumpet players will play the passage on whatever instrument they have that they feel they can play it the best on. And that's kind of a, a weird circumstance there. I don't, there's no other instrument that will do that. A clarinet player will go out of their way to play something on a B flat or an A clarinet if they've got it a C clarinet. They're not gonna go changing it about. But a trumpet player, um, I've got four trumpets around me. Which one do I want to use today? And it, it it's a very different mentality. And uh, there is there is a interesting psychological question there that goes along, I think, with trumpet players' personalities. In that, you know, trumpet players, and this goes back to a lot of old stereotypes. You know, the the joke is, how many trumpet players does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, and the answer is 100. One, uh, 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 well, there's several different answers to it. Uh, one is to, 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 to put it in and 99 to say how they could do it better. Or you know, the other answer is one. And he just stands there and lets the world revolve around him. And I say him in this case, and I normally am, uh, try to be a little bit more uh, gender conscious, but in this case, it almost always is him. Um, the the female trumpet players I know don't do this. It's it's almost invariably a, a male centric issue. Um, take that for what it is. There may be a connection between trumpet players and testosterone. Um, that may be another controversial take there, but. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the history on trumpets and the, the shrinking size. Um, it's really the only thing I can think of where people really kind of want to shrink the size of something to, to make it um, to make the job easier. Um, make it that what you will. All right, uh, let's see. So uh, let's go ahead and start fielding some more questions. Um, I know that there's like 10 people in the room, so not everybody, you know, say something at once, so, but. If not, I'll just sit here and drink more coffee. Um, but, uh, yeah. So uh, I will, I'll touch on something else I am, I'm working on right now. Um, now that I have volume three done, and if you have ordered a, a print copy, they will be um, uh, shipping out hopefully soon. Um, 
I've just got a little bit of delay on the production and the things. Uh, but I've started finally work on the second edition of Volume uh, 1, which is going to take me quite a while because it's going to end up being a complete rewrite. Uh, maybe the closest thing is horn players' discretion over changing sides of double horn. Horn music now isn't written for F, B flat sides, but older horn music specified other crooks too. Um, yeah, so... Um, Horn has has changed, though. Interestingly, um, there are so if you're, you want to play old natural horn music, say you have a part for horn in D, no problem. Just play it on the F side, put down valves one and two. You're now playing horn in D, and that's actually how a lot of horn players are taught uh, that valves one and two is horn in D. It's not uh, this is the finger. This is horn in D. First valve is horn in E flat. Uh, Second valve is horn in E. And you can do this on both sides of the instrument. So thumb is horn in B flat. And when I was conducting the, um, the Mozart Grand Partita, I asked horns one and two to play it a la um, natural horn. So I said, play it, please play everything with first valve. Um, because I think everything in first and second horns was horn in E flat. There may have been one movement with, which was horn in F. Uh, I couldn't do that uh, for horns three and four, though, because horns three and four were in B flat basso, and there's just absolutely no way to do that, so I just said, play the notes. Uh, thoughts on the pocket trumpet? Not a lot to think about. It's mostly designed um, for traveling or for novelty, um, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, brass instruments are such that you can make novelty instruments so easily, um, that, um, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so the pocket trumpet is just a, a novelty, it's a rewrapped, um, the thing with, with, with any instrument, you want fewer bends. The fewer bends, the less impedance there is in the airflow. So this particular trumpet actually has one extra bend in a cornet uh, here. So this is actually uh, dummy tubing right here. Um, and the tubing actually goes up through this bend. Uh, this will put in um, a little bit extra. Uh, oh, cool. I never got that far with being encouraged to play natural. Yeah, uh, it, it will be a different sound. Uh, one of the things that uh, a horn player friend of mine told me is have them take out all the rest of the valve slides. And that will actually um, um, work. Uh, what do you think an ideal trumpet section is for a large work? Do you think... More members of the trumpet family are needed, i.e. alto or tenor trumpets. Well, we do have alto and tenor trumpets. Um, those do exist. Um, the, okay, so let's let's talk the, the term tenor trumpet. The, the tenor trumpet is what is commonly known as a bass trumpet, either in C or B flat. It is a tenor voice, and if we look at the literature for it, uh, the vast majority of music for the, the so-called bass trumpet is actually super, super high. Uh, Richard Wagner is the, the first composer to really exploit it. Um, and his parts are just incredibly high. So calling it a bass trumpet is really kind of a misnomer. Uh, the, the instruments are designed to play in their middle and upper register. They're not really designed to play low. Um, that said... Um, Larger, uh, larger trumpet sections. I so I'll talk about the the two larger ones that I've done. So Symphony Two in the Forest of Dreams, I use this trumpet section of six, and I treat it actually uh, kind of interestingly. So part one is uh, so it's on piccolo, E flat trumpet, two C trumpets, a B flat trumpet, and a tenor trumpet or bass trumpet, um, and. Um, so it, it's similar to bass flute. Yes, uh, you will. You actually will have more um, people uh, agreeing with with me that uh, that it's a a tenor instrument. In fact, if you go back into 
early Vincent Bach catalogs, he would call it a tenor trumpet. Uh, there is an article by Donald Hunsberger, who was the longtime director of uh, the Eastman Wind Ensemble. Uh, he was taught, he wrote an article about the tenor trumpet and saying that it, we should not call it a bass trumpet. We should call it a tenor because that's what it is. Uh, anyway, so back to Symphony 2. Um, so I have piccolo, E flat, two Cs, B flat, and a, a tenor. And... I, I treat each of those different instruments uh, pretty differently. So the um, the piccolo and the E flat really work a lot together. They're much more florid. They play a lot more. Um, the C trumpets kind of group together. The B flat and the tenor I group together too. So I actually really treat the B flat trumpet a differently than I treat the C trumpets because the B flat trumpet will have a little bit huskier sound than the C's. The C's are kind of clear. Uh, so isn't the valve trombone a bass trumpet with fewer bends? Um, yes and no. And it's going to depend on the instrument itself. Um, actually, they're going to have the exact same number of bends. Uh, but what you will find is bass trumpets, by and large, will have a much smaller bore size than will uh, valve trombones. Uh, the bell size will be smaller. Uh, the biggest uh, size of a bell you'll see on a bass trumpet is about six inches. Whereas trombones, a small trombone is like seven and a half inches and going up to nine and a half for a tenor trombones. Um, yeah, exactly. Trombones are, depends mostly on lead pipe and bell position. Um, and, you know, and, and so I, I was looking at this the other day with an instrument tech friend of mine. Um, and we brought up uh, the spec on a the Bach bass trumpet. And its bore size is like 485, maybe 495. That's... Um, inches 0.485 or 0.495 the smallest uh bore tenor trombone you'll find on the market is about 0 0.5 0 0.500 so there's there's a hair bit of difference there it's it's not a lot but bass trumpets tend to be much smaller in bore size it's smaller in bell more compact overall but you will find that uh, a lot of the um the internal parts are actually interchangeable between the two. So a um, the the valve section of the two instruments may be identical. Um, so, uh, and I'm trying to think, have there been any instances where you have used a uh, bass trumpet alongside valve trombones? And... I, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Um, it, the Vienna Philharmonic used valve trombones until about 1890, maybe about 1900. Um, the, the Czech Philharmonic would use them through about that time period. All the Italian opera houses would use valve trombones. Uh, but I don't think any of them were using bass trumpets regularly. A bigger low B flat bell front instrument isn't fun to hold. I tried out a marching euphonium once. Uh, yeah, so interestingly, that gets me back to the contrabass trumpet that I was talking about earlier when I um, was um, photographing uh, Dr. Kleinstuber's contrabass trumpet. Uh, it was surprisingly light. Um, he, had, he had braced it in a way that it just it's it was much much lighter than a a marching baritone and which is lighter than marching euphonium too even though it's a longer instrument uh so yeah uh, so back to larger trumpet sections um symphony three that i wrote is and um Uh, okay, so since you would treat the bass trumpet as a tenor roll, would you say that the contrabass trumpet is the true bass of the section? If this is so, perhaps these two instruments should be renamed. 
Um, contrabass trumpets are so unusual that it's not really going to matter. Um, there might be a couple dozen contrabass trumpets in the world. It's not, I mean, you're not going to see them often. I just happen to have a friend who has made them. Um, I, I call, uh, anytime I use a, a bass trumpet in the score, I call it a tenor. Um, I, and the thing about that is that these instruments, so... No, t tenor or bass trumpet uh, is never going to be played by a trumpet player. They're always, um, 95, 99% of the time, are going to be played by a trombonist or a euphoniumist. They're not going to be played by your trumpet player. And this is one of those uh, areas where uh, Stravinsky got into a little bit of trouble with his orchestration of Rite of Spring because he has trumpet five double on bass trumpet. Well, guess what? That doesn't work. They have to hire another player just to play the bass trumpet part. So you've got six people in the trumpet section, but only five ever play at once. Just which five they are, stay tuned to find out. Okay, so back to the trumpet section I used in Symphony 3. I went overboard with the trumpet section in Symphony 3. Um, and I'll say this, I don't particularly like trumpets. Um, that may be another hot take for uh, a later, but um, anyway, uh, yeah, so um, with, with Symphony 3, I use a trumpet section of 20 players, and that's a lot, particularly because there's already 80 players on stage. And then at the final, um, brass players should be more flexible with doubling. It's not that, it's not how that works because there it's, it has to do with their lip muscles. They double across pitch size rather than family. So woodwind players can go from high to low within the same family. Brass players can't do that. Brass players have to stay within their same pitch class because it involves different sets of muscles. We basically learned that cornets are usually nicer last week. Uh, yes, well, they're, they're nicer until you want that really heroic, bright, triumphal sound. Then you gotta go trumpets. And that's what I wanted. Uh, so basically, the end of Symphony 3 is a giant sunrise and I surround the entire audience with 20 trumpet players. So the first two trumpet players you actually hear are going to be way up high in the balcony, and I've got up there two E-flat alto trumpets. So you got these alto trumpets calling back and forth to one another and back to the band on stage. It'd be a really, really cool effect. And then from right behind the audience down on the main floor, are going to be behind you six C trumpets. And I want the C's there because they have that nice, bright, clear sound. And then on the right side of the audience and on the left side of the audience are another six trumpets each. So on this side over here, I've got a B flat piccolo, uh, E flat, three B flats, and a tenor. And I've got the same thing over here, a piccolo, an E-flat, three B-flats, and a tenor. And so for the whole ensemble, if I go from high to low, it's two piccolos, two E-flats, six Cs, six B-flats, two altos, two tenors. And that's a lot of trumpets there. And they only play for the final five minutes of the piece, and you can go hear this on, on the channel. So you, but you have to wait 65 minutes before you hear the first trumpet note. And those poor trumpet players are just going to sit there waiting. One day I'll hear it. But there are some other examples of stuff like that. Um, the best known example I can give you is um, Leos Janacek's Symphonietta. Oh, God, I love that piece. It is just absolutely fantastic. The first movement of the Sinfonietta is a fanfare. It is for nine 
B flat trumpets, two bass trumpets, two euphoniums, and timpani. And you're just this wall of trumpets, and typical performance, the wall of trumpets is behind the orchestra. Now, in the orchestra, there's another three trumpets. So you've got uh, nine plus two, 11 in the ensemble, and then another three. So there's a total of 14 trumpet players in that piece. And it is, uh, so the first movement is just the, um, just the extra trumpets. Then movements two, three, four are normal. They're the regular orchestra trumpets. Then movement five is the regular trumpets for a while. And then boom, all of a sudden the fanfare comes back. And now you've got the fanfare in the back and then the full orchestra and you've got everybody going. I'm picturing that effect, and my God, that would be an awesome experience. Too bad I live far from Texas. Well, talk to some uh, big-name band directors where you are and put something together if they are ambitious enough. Um, I heard the Canadian military band play a concert in which they had fanfare trumpets in the catwalks. Yeah, so offstage trumpets like that are not uncommon. It's an effect that's gone on i mean we have it in beethoven so beethoven would write uh, offstage trumpet solos in the the leonore overtures uh which were the uh, preliminary overtures he wrote before um finally settling on the overture used for fidelio so beethoven was using offstage trumpets um and just offstage trumpets has been so commonly used. I mean, you've got offstage trumpets in the Verdi Requiem. Uh, God, Mahler uses them all the time. Um, I think they're in Symphony 1, Symphony 2. Symphony 3 has the offstage flugelhorn. Uh, no offstage in 4, 5, 6, 7. 8 has an entire, basically separate brass band um, in it, uh, offstage. Uh, and then, of course, there's Berlioz, the Berlioz Requiem. My God, I have seen the Berlioz Requiem live once, and the Berlioz Requiem needs four, four brass ensembles placed in different parts of the hall. One of them will be on stage with the rest of the orchestra, and then you've got another three position. And there's just, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, living bot. Yeah, that affects somewhere around there. If you've got connections, you know, let me know. I'm, man, I, I'd love to have something like that played in, in Symphony Hall. Um, another example is the trumpet solo in American Elegy. Yes, um, I played American Elegy. Had to have been spring of two thousand and one when it was brand new. I think we were one of the first bands to ever play it. Um, so I remember that trumpet solo pretty distinctly. Uh, the, the, some of the issues with, with offstage trumpet solos um, have to do with the, the conducting, and that's with any solo. Um, a lot of times you have to set up a closed circuit uh, television. So kind of like the setup I've got now with uh, looking into the camera, and it would be wired into a um, um, uh, a monitor off stage, and this would have been very very difficult before that technology was available. Uh, but somehow they managed it. Uh, a lot of times it would actually involve a a separate conductor, um, so one conductor on stage, of course, and then another one watching. The conductor and then being able to communicate to the offstage player so that becomes uh, a logistical nightmare and but nowadays with um you know just the closed circuit tv camera it works really well um uh i was gonna say something like uh pines of rome but there are no offstage trumpets in pines of rome and uh, <laughs> fight me on this one but um, you know if you know the pines of rome you know there are offstage brass in the final movement and i take that back i take that back there is an offstage trumpet solo the tromba interna and 
one solo, but it's not the final big brass at the end. The final big brass at the end is all flugelhorns. And um, so it, it's never done on flugelhorns either, which is a crying shame because uh, Urespeaky wanted the sound of bugles playing, not the sound of trumpets. He wanted bugles. And he's very specific in the score, too. In fact, I have never once seen or heard a performance of Pines of Rome with the correct instrumentation. It just, I, I don't think anybody knows enough to do it. So it should be two flugelhorns, two baritone horns, two euphoniums. And in the orchestra, there should be a contrabass trombone instead of a tuba. Or a chimbasso instead of a tuba. No, there's no tuba part. Uh, but that's for a different video. Um, let's see. What else can we talk about trumpets? Um, wh what other questions we got, guys? Um, well, if I'm not going to get any, any questions coming in, well, of course, there's a 20 second lag. What am I saying? Um, I will go ahead and talk about uh, the, the streaming course that I'm going to be doing. Uh, coming up uh, in a month, month and a half or so. I've got to work out all the details on that. But what I'm going to be doing is um, an orchestration and composition class. And it's going to be divided up into mini sessions. Each mini session will last five weeks. Um, from, so from start to finish, you your final assignment will be to write a piece for, uh, the first mini course will be flute. So we're just going to go with score order. And so from start of lesson one to the end, you have five weeks to write one piece for solo unaccompanied flute. And I will have a professional flute player um, come in um, and they would be, uh, come in and play your piece. So you would actually get a, a performance of your piece at the end of it. Uh, I won't say that it will be uh, a great quality performance, uh, a, not a great quality recording at any rate, because I think everything will need to be done on Skype. Uh, but the course will include um, exercises. It will include listening um, requirements. Um, but that, that's only going to be set up through Patreon. How would you improve the design of the trumpet if you would change anything? Um, uh, I would want trumpet... Uh, I want trumpet players first to use the old F trumpets when called for. I, I, I think that, that would be my change. Um, but on the design, I mean, I actually, I actually I'll say this. Something I, I, I really think is absolutely genius are on the rotary valve trumpets. And that's something we haven't really talked about. Rotary valve versus piston valve because there is a big difference there. Uh, rotary valves will pres preserve a little bit more of that heroic and noble quality, whereas pistons are a little bit smoother and a little bit more cornet-like. Um, but on the top end rotary trumpets, there are keys for the pinky. Now, one of the keys is the, the spit valve. But uh, players have gotten to where they can use those keys as uh, harmonic vents, just like a... Um, um, uh, an octave key on a saxophone or a register key on a clarinet. So the trumpet players have these keys. And uh, so originally they just had the, the spit valve. And guess what? That spit valve was in a perfect place to help aid the production of high A. They added another one that helped with production of high B or high B flat and so on. And they've got those. And if you can add something like that to uh, piston valve trumpets, be absolutely fantastic. I think fourth valve... Um, would be absolutely wonderful to have, uh, particularly for just for tuning issues because the fourth valve replaces one and three. Is there a modern trumpet in low G? Uh, yes, kind of. Um, Monet has made one, uh, one, um, and, but uh, most uh, of the, the low G trumpets are what you would, what went under the name of G or soprano bugle. So from uh, old DCI days when everybody had to use B 
bugles in G. Well, they weren't actually bugles. The sopranos were trumpets, just in low G. And there was a very brief window of time from about 1990 to about 2001 when they were three valve instruments. Just, And this is what baffles me about VCI. They had these weird rules in place saying, oh, no, we're going to limit you to technology from 100 years ago, 150 years ago. You can't progress to today's technology. It's like, oh, that gets me back onto marching band and I don't want to go there. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they would use these uh, low uh, G trumpets. And it's actually, um, if you listen to old DCI recordings uh, prior to 2001, uh, you will hear a very different sound. And hear these really what sound like screaming high parts but they're not really that high uh but they're using a much larger instrument uh are bro baroque trumpets necessary for revival i feel like baroque trumpet should be used only for period concerts like oae uh interestingly i do know that there have been some modern orchestras and I, I want to say something like San Francisco Symphony has done that, uh, where they will use all modern instruments, but say the trumpet players need to play on natural instruments. And that does make a difference in sound um, because they are so fundamentally different to, to play on a natural trumpet versus a, um, a, a, a valve trumpet. Uh, interestingly... I was uh, doing a bit of study on Mahler's Das Klagen der Lied. One of his very early pieces, well before Symphony One, um, Das Klagen der Lied is an early cantata by Mahler. And he has some very strange instrumentation in it. So he has one point in there. You know, everything's written for, and this is in the horn section, not in the trumpets, but he has valve horns for everything. And then for one section, in, I think, the last movement, um, I can't remember which movement, uh, but he has them switch over to natural horns. And the, the video I was watching of the orchestra, boom, they break out the natural horns because it is absolutely required of the sound. He couldn't do it on a, a, a nat, uh, valve instrument. Uh, yeah, I don't see many of the old G instruments on eBay. And when I do, it's often a two-valve model. Yeah, it, it's... The two valve, um, because uh, the three valves were not made for very long. Maybe, you know, they started production on them about 1990. And DCI switched to being able to use B-flat instruments in 2001. And at that point, every single big name drum corps switched to B-flat and F instruments. And the G instruments died interestingly um bladder's book uh instrumentation and orchestration and i guess uh the second edition of that came out in 98 and i i guess that's the last edition of it um uh, talks about the the family of g bugles and you know the being the, now three valve instruments and says this would be a fantastic resource to use for composers and it wasn't three years after the publication of that book that the G instruments basically had their death sentence. And what further cemented that death sentence is just a few months ago, the last maker of them was Canstall. And uh, Canstall would make anything that, in their catalog if you wanted it. And they, so they still offered for sale all the G instruments. I mean, you could get... On the old cancel site, up until just a few months ago, uh, that so that G soprano bugle would run you under a thousand bucks, which you know for a, a professional level instrument is a pretty good price. Now it's not going to be top of the line. It's not going to do everything like a symphonic model trumpet's going to do, but it, it'll work. Um, and then cancel just suddenly went out of business, and it was the strangest thing. In fact, I even, I, I talked to Jack Canstall a, uh, uh, a couple months before the business went out. 
Uh, and I don't think they were planning on it. Uh, they announced a brand new model of trumpet, and then like two days later, they announced that they were laying off everybody. It was the biz most bizarre thing. Uh, luckily, um, all of the machinery and the parts, and it's all been bought by uh, BAC uh, Instruments, uh, Best American Craftsman in Kansas City, and they have everything that can still had and they are going to start making stuff again i don't know if they'll ever make the g instruments but um i that's a place i'd actually like to go up to kansas city to visit them at some point because i think they'd be the company to really talk to you know we've talked about on here uh like the bass horn or the alto euphonio and i think they'd be the, the company to do it um yeah, there are some interesting instruments from that world. Yeah, and, you know, I, I do bring them up a little bit in, in here. It's like they would, you know, you they've got a, a G flugelhorn that they would use in the old DCI days. Uh, and and so, you know, a G flugelhorn, that would be really kind of nice to have. Imagine a section of different sizes of flugelhorns. How cool would that be? But... Uh, I, I know that at some point they even experimented with a very small high G. Tiny little thing. But, yeah. Um, but back to the question, what would I improve on in trumpet design? I don't think I would improve too much on trumpet design. What I would improve, though, is a, a shift in mentality uh for trumpet players to um try and be much more authentic to composers wishes um and i i think that that um that that's an up road, uphill battle and one that a composer will never win but if there could be a shift to say hey make the best effort to to follow the conduct the composer's wishes I would play a G alto mellow instrument and possibly record with it one day. Um, yeah, I mean, you can probably find those. I, I've seen a high C piccolo trumpet. Yes, they do exist. Uh, Shilky makes one. I think Yamaha makes one. Uh, I talk about it in like one sentence in volume three. I said, there are C piccolo trumpets out there. Um, these are specialist instruments and they are not something that you are going to write for. Um, uh, I guess you guys all know Richard Bobo, good friend of mine. Um, you know, he comments that, uh, the trumpet player that he works with most often actually has a C piccolo and will use it, uh, from time to time. Uh, in, but that's in addition to the B flat A, uh, piccolo. Now, yeah, I've, I've been talking to, to Richard quite a bit the last few days. and If you have not seen his Harry, the Harry Potter and the Missing Crumbhorn, go watch that. That's actually really pretty cool. And I did a little bit of help with him on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's uh, we've got a little bit over an hour. Um, 